So, a very warm welcome to another lecture on this course on simulation of communication systems using MATLAB. Till now, we have covered the basics of MATLAB, uh, some matrix operations in MATLAB, we have talked about generating signals in MATLAB, their Fourier analysis, convolution naturally and uh, we have talked about uh, randomness and probability. So, this will this lecture will be different from all the previous lectures in the sense that uh, so the earlier lectures on uh, introducing MATLAB were heavy on programming and uh, they uh, talked about some ideas from mathematics. Then the last three or four lectures about uh, probability theory were uh, involved next to no programming or actually no programming and uh, they talked about mathematics. This lecture will be unique and different from all of uh, those preceding it and uh, those come after it in the sense that uh, in this lecture we will uh, try to understand the philosophy. So, now with all of the information that we have about probability theory and the, all of the information that we have about uh, MATLAB and I believe that you have some basic idea about communication systems. So, we have enough information or we have enough background to talk about the basic philosophy of this course or uh, talk about uh, what are we going to do for the rest of the course and uh, that is talk about uh, practical data. So, uh, we have seen that uh, deterministic signals such as uh, convolution or convolution through a deterministic uh, linear time invariant system generation of a sinusoid etc. All these operations are uh, easy to understand, you can cover it those in a signals and systems course and they are, those signals are easy to play with and uh, you can do almost anything with deterministic signals in MATLAB using uh, very basic programming. Actually, I could have spent uh, one lecture and uh, generated both amplitude modulation and uh, frequency modulation signals, but uh, that uh, I would leave as exercises because those are not complicated, but uh, those are uh, based on what you already know generating an AM signal or an FM signal in MATLAB is quite easy and uh, that is not pertinent to the rest of this course. So, I am leaving that part, but uh, the idea is that uh, when we are taught analog communications, when we are taught AM, when we are taught FM, we are taught modulation. So, in our basic communications courses, taught modulation or the ideas of modulation AM, FM, etc., using deterministic. modulation signals. So, we are taught these using deterministic uh, modulation signals that is you modulate uh, using sin omega m t or cos omega m t etcetera. But the question is that uh, practically you do not uh, modulate using sin omega m t cos omega m t or uh, variants of uh, these signals. You do not modulate using a triangular wave or a sawtooth wave, those are just good for uh, letting you know how AM works, but uh, those are impractical. Because as uh, if you have at any point of time connected a speaker to a signal generator and heard how a sinusoid sounds or how a pure sinusoid sounds, it sounds like a single note from a piano if you have not heard of it. So, it will go like uh, it will sound if you produce a sinusoid it will simply sound like a something like uh, a plane wave totally constant. So, it will basically act as uh, in a pure sinusoid is an irritating irritant noise. So, you do not want that. So, now the question is that uh, if we talk about practical AM or practical FM systems, we do not want to hear sinusoids on practical AM or practical FM systems. In fact, if a receiver wants a sinusoid, say cos omega m t, sin omega m t, if a receiver wants those, they can just know the frequency 
and generate it on their own rather than uh, having it be transmitted to them via FM or AM or anything like so that. So, this raises two questions, one then why do we build all use cases using these and two, uh, so if we do not send sinusoids then what do we send. So, we will answer both of these questions. The first is that uh, as we can see that uh, any signal can be viewed in two bases the time domain and the frequency domain which are uh, just or a signal can be viewed as uh, a linear combination of time impulses or it can be viewed as uh, a linear co combination of sinusoids. So, sending a sinusoid is basically sending one of those uh, constituent components of a signal which uh, makes analysis of practical signals which contain multiple sinusoids and cosinusoids. A practical signal has a finite Fourier transform or uh, a continuous type Fourier transform that you know. So, which makes that analysis easy that is the first part of the story. The second part of the story is that if we do not send uh, determined signals then what do we send. So, the answer is that uh, we want to transmit information or uh, we want to transmit data that is uh, rather unknown to the user or uh, the information is contained only in the unknown. We have to or uh, this is uh, one basic idea that uh, we should uh, acquaint ourselves with that uh, information only comes from or the knowledge of something or knowledge of how something works or the knowledge about something can contains information only if you are uncertain about how it works. Say you grab a school child or uh, grab a 10 year old and start explaining uh, that the earth revolves to around the sun to them and uh, most likely uh, they will uh, say but I already know this and uh, one famous movie dialogue I do not know how many of you have watched that movie I have not watched that movie, but uh, I know the dialogue it says that tell me something I do not know. So, yeah information is like that you want to know something that you do not know. So, we do not want to transmit sinusoids or cosinusoids over signals we want to transmit information that is unknown that is unlikely or uh, we want to transmit data that you do not know about. Similarly, when we are actually interpreting data or uh, we are doing some research, we generate some data and based on that data we interpret the results and uh, we try to see what sense does that data make. But if we already know before we start our research, if we already know that uh, this set of data is going to tell us this or uh, even before we start uh, conducting some research and we know that uh, this research is going to give us this results, then naturally the resources that you put into that research are useless because uh, you conduct research only because you do not know what the outcomes will be. So, if you know outcomes before research then those that research is useless. So, which means that uh, all our efforts, all the research efforts, all the communication efforts are into demystifying what is unknown. And what is unknown as we will see can be modeled well using uh, randomness and that is why we talked about randomness. So, as an example here, so as an example of research or as an example of uh, how data or how the randomness in data fits into models of simulating communication systems, we will consider the example of clinical trials. So, this video is originally being recorded in 2023 uh, in the month of uh, May. It has been 3 years uh, since the COVID pandemic started or thankfully we are uh, kind of out of the pandemic now and it uh, has been 2 years since uh, the vaccines uh, were administered to most people. So, but one question that uh, all of us might have come across if you are watching this uh, in 2003 or, uh, or you are from a generation that 
grew up reading this vaccine data in, in the news etc would be that uh, say x vaccine has y percent efficacy in randomized double blind clinical trials. So, X vaccine has uh, Y percent efficacy in uh, double blind randomized clinical trials. So, in this lecture let us try to demystify these terms and uh, with that we will understand the value of uh, probability theory and randomness in generating research data or in actual uh, practical research. So, say there is a disease or uh, for this instead of the vaccine let us first look at treatments and uh, say that uh, someone says that uh, they have snake oil. Suppose uh, someone claims to have extracted snake oil and uh, they claim that this snake oil is a cure for common cold and uh, everyone who takes snake oil is cured within 7 days of the first administration and everyone should take snake oil. Based on that recommendation and they say that we had a hospital, we admitted people with common cold into that hospital and uh, we administered everyone snake oil and uh, that administration of snake oil led to 100 percent recovery within 7 days. So, those are impressive ad numbers that uh, you take snake oil and uh, it helps you recover very good. So, they sell you the ad and uh, you decide to buy snake oil and the snake oil farm makes a lot of uh, money fine, but uh, herein lies the catch. What if you did not take snake oil? What happens then? Even if you do not take snake oil common cold cures itself within 7 days. So, what is the benefit of snake oil? None. So, that one common sense question. So, when you are uh, talking about some medicine or uh, some cure for a problem, you do not just tell what happens when you take that cure. You tell that this happens when you take the cure and this happens when you do not take the cure. So, you have to always have to compare against a control group or against people who did not take that cure. So, that said, now let us move on to the case for a health drink. Say, let me call it Corlex. Uh, there is a health drink called Corlex, and what they claim is our drink makes children taller or kids who drink Corlex are taller than kids who do not drink Corlex. And you basically add chocolate flavor and put lot of sugar. So, what the company could do is uh, a large part of uh, the height of humans is genetic. It is in your genes that if the parents are tall, most likely the children will also be tall. So, what they could do is the sales people could go around identifying uh, households with uh, tall parents and uh, give uh, everyone corlicks and uh, say, tell them that okay, you have been you are the lucky winners and uh, we have uh, identified you as people who would uh, benefit from Corlix. So, uh, take Corlix for free for 6 months and in return we just want to measure your uh, children's height for the next 6 months. So, and you go to households with shorter parents and uh, tell them we uh, take this money and we want to uh, measure the height of your kids. We are conducting a survey and you naturally select in the Corlix group you put people who are naturally bound to be taller the results will always be in your favor. So, Corlick it is not a causation, you, you have manually manipulated that data 
to ascertain that uh, kids who end up drinking Corlicks end out to be taller. So, that is not how it should be done. Those children should be or uh, the test group should be selected randomly. It is not that uh, you pick up a favored text group and, uh, and administer that them your medicine. That is not the right idea. The right idea is that uh, regardless of their genes, everyone should be administered the same treatment and then they should uh, know whether or not this treatment is effective. So, that is the second thing. So, it should be randomized and neither the, ad the guy administering it nor uh, so, if the guy who is administering the medicine knows the benefit or knows that uh, this person is bound to be more uh, benefited by this treatment than this, so he might be biased and the person who is taking that treatment should also not know because that leads to something called placebo effect that uh, is the means that you could read about on the internet. So, in order to avoid the placebo effect on either side, these trials should be double blind. So, these should be randomized double blind clinical trials that that is the subjects who take that treatment and the subjects who do not take that treatment should be chosen randomly. So, randomness comes into play. So, you can say that you can have uh, identical sugar solutions or identical sweet solutions and uh, put the Corlix components in one of those and uh, do not put the Corlix com components in the other one and uh, just mark them blue envelope and, and green envelope and you do not know what is in the blue envelope and what is in the green envelope. So, half of the people take the blue envelope, half of the people randomly take the green envelope and uh, then you determine the performance of the blue envelope against the green envelope and then you tell them that uh, at the end the guy who is analyzing the data should know that uh, uh, the blue envelope contained this and the green envelope contained this. So, you know that way. So, now while testing the efficacy of a vaccine, you take a population, you inject half of them randomly with possibly water or uh, something else and you inject the other half with the actual vaccine and then after a while, after say 10 days, 15 days, 30 days, you test how many of them got the disease. If the number of people who were actually vaccinated or who were given the actual vaccine had a lower proportion of getting infected by the virus in the same time, then naturally you would say that uh, the vaccine is effective and uh, that efficacy is measured using the Bayes theorem that uh, we will come to later when we discuss mathematics because as I promised there will be no math in this lecture. So, this leaves us with questions or this discussion leaves us with some questions. One how to randomize, these require mathematical answers or programming answers, how to randomize and how does Bayes theorem help us in determining the efficacy of a vaccine. So, out of these, the second question that is how does uh, the Bayes theorem help us in determining the efficacy of a vaccine that I will answer in the next lecture and uh, how do we randomize, we will uh, answer in the lecture after that. So, because we know the Bayes theorem and this will be, so the next lecture will be a really short one and it will talk about uh, how do we test the efficacy of a vaccine using Bayes theorem and uh, clinical data. So, that is all for now. Thank you.